Uh, today I'm going to talk about the management of pediatric stone disease. We're going to have a couple of discussions here, more of like the controversies and some of the things that people uh, have thought about in the past and what is uh, concerning when it comes to the surgical management of stones. Uh, just quickly, we're going to just touch on the AUA guidelines for stone disease in particular for pediatric patients. Um, uh, when it comes to uncomplicated ureteral stones, we can proceed with uh, observation with or without medical expulsion therapy uh, for stones less than 10 millimeter. Um, and then there's uh, guidelines regarding, um, uh, you know, obtaining a low dose CT scan on pediatric patients prior to performing PCNLs. Um, but there's also, you know, concern, you know, patients are now receiving uh, radiation at a young age. So we're going to talk about that and risk for developing uh, uh, leukemias or solid cancers as a result. Um, then one thing that was here that um, is, is of note is for ureteral stones, uh, clinicians, clinicians should not routinely place a stent uh, prior to ureteroscopy. Uh, so we're going to touch uh, base on that. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, renal stone burden, it's kind of broken up based on size less than uh, two centimeters and greater than two centimeters, um, greater than two being um, use of uh, PCNL. Um, and then these new uh, advances in mini PCNLs and micro PCNLs, which we'll touch on, as well as shockwaves, lithotripsy. Uh, of note, shockwave is um, present in both of these criteria. You can go as you know well above two centimeters, but one of the things that they do discuss is, or one of the things that we're going to today is, um, you know, using a ureteral stent or nephrostomy tube um, to assist with um, uh, the removal of these stones. Um, uh, in terms of more invasive options, these are uh, things that we try to avoid uh, with the advent of new ureteroscopic um, uh, technology uh, that we'll talk about. Um, uh, and then in terms of asymptomatic and non-obstructing stones, active surveillance. So, uh, if we have a case patient, this is a patient that operated on several months ago. It's a 10-year-old boy who had lesh nyhan syndrome, uh, as well as neurogenic bowel and bladder and G-tube. Uh, it's previously known to have had xanthine stones. Uh, was noted on his um, follow-up uh, imaging uh, as an ultra-low dose CT uh, to have a large nearly two centimeter stone in the upper pole of the right kidney, as well as a uh, roughly 1.3 centimeter stone um, in the extrarenal pelvis on the left side. Um, of note, he is on allopurinol. Um, that's a, that's uh, interesting because in these patients who have Lesh Nyhan, um, they have HEPRT deficiency. Um, so they are not able to participate in purine salvage. And often these purines then um, proceed down into uh, uric acid and formation, and they're prone to uric acid stones. Um, however, use of allopurinol now shunts um, by blocking xanthine oxidase now into uh, xanthinuria. Um, so uh, xanthine stones historically are difficult um, to note in that uh, they're radiolucent, uh, but they can also be hard to find on ultrasound um, due to um, crystalluria sometimes uh, making it difficult for them to see. Treatment usually for these patients is um, being mindful of their hydration. Often they do need a gastrostomy tube um, as well as alkalinization of the urine, and he is on polycitra. Um, in terms of epidemiology, so the, essentially there's been a significant increase in, in, in children and pediatric patients being diagnosed with stones, usually in, in, in older ages, 12 to 17. Um, and um, it's, it's likely that, um, you know, one, you know, they, they, there are more emergency room visits, um, but there's also probably due to um, more um, cross-sectional imaging of the abdomen, which we'll talk about here. Um, what I wanted to touch on here is that um, with this increase in these emergency room visits and, and subsequently hospital admin ad admissions for possible stones or theoretical stones, which do not require or may not need any surgical intervention, um, you're now talking, you know, with these ED visits, uh, you know, roughly $4,000 per ED visit is $146 million. Um, and uh, hospital admissions, on average hospital admissions um, in this Routh study is roughly uh, around $13,900. So that total uh, burden is around $375 million. Now, uh, frequently, you know, intervention may be needed, but um, a lot of times, we've noticed that a lot of times patients are being admitted from their symptoms and then don't need an intervention. So we'll talk about medical expulsion therapy and, um, you know, whether, whether admission is necessary. Okay. Um, 
Uh, one of the things is here is that younger children less than 10 often present with symptoms that are not um, necessarily pain, but often just UTI or painless hematuria. Um, and then they, and then that's, uh, they need to they end up requiring a, a workup of an inpatient workup. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of these increase of use of CT scans, these are largely driven. Um, this, uh, I don't know if there's a mouse here. Um, so second line here with the squares. Um, comparatively, these are largely being driven by um, increased abdominal pelvic imaging uh, in children of five to 15 years of age, slightly, uh, slightly older. Um, now this has tripled as a result. Now you have uh, this radiation effective dose in, in young developing children. Um, and uh, a lot, oftentimes these are, uh, are approaching levels of, you know, 10 millisieverts um, as the effective dose takes into account uh, radial sensitivity of the tissue as well as the radiation source itself. Um, so we know that children have more radial sensitive tissues in proportion than adults. And as a result, they're more sensitive um, to this radiation. Okay. Um, so when it comes to uh, ab abdominal pelvic imaging, uh, there's much higher rates of solid cancer risks. Um, these risks are, you know, are often, the cancers then, um, can be both colonic, stomach, um, less so prostatic, um, um, but usually more um, abdominal. Um, there's higher rates um, in females than males. Um, and it's projected to, you know, that uh, a radiation induced solid cancer um, can occur, you know, one can occur in every 350 um, abdominal pelvic imaging in girls to a roughly one in every 700 scans that are performed in, in, a, in a boy. So do we really need CT imaging for symptomatic stones? Remember the guidelines discuss, you know, performing them before PCNLs. And in, those, in, in, in that setting, it'd be reasonable to get an assessment of the anatomy, okay? Um, but, um, you know, the, several, many studies, and this is, this is just one, but have looked at uses of ultrasound and KUB um, and, and whether they're comparable to CT. Um, and the, the end conclusion usually always came down to, um, you know, a majority of these stones, these are small stones that get missed. Maybe they distal ureteral stones or renal stones. Um, you know, they could be picked up on KUB if they were obtained, uh, but there would be no change in management for these small, um, either not obstructing renal stones or small distal ureteral stones um, in terms of surgical management. Um, medical expulsion therapy would have been more than adequate. Um, so multiple studies have showed that there was no change in their management. Uh, so in, 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 in summation for the role of imaging, uh, KUB and ultrasound um, should be uh, first line for evaluation in children with stone. Um, and uh, uh, use of low dose CT scanning protocol should be requested. Um, you know, low dose CTs decrease the tube current um, in a CT by uh, from 100% down to essentially 25% um, at the at the ultra low end, uh, which can turn a 10 millisievert uh, radiation effective dose down to 2.5. Um, uh, and then in terms of postoperative following for imaging, um, again, uh, KUB and or ultrasound. Let's talk about medical expulsion therapy. Okay. Um, uh, first off, this is a study by um, Ertehan um, out, of the, out of Turkey. There's a, a very productive group. Um, they looked at lower ureteral stones only. And of note, there was no difference in the two groups, group one being use of NSAID, um, 10 milligrams BID uh, for a total of 10, 10 uh, mg per kg per day. Um, in the second group, they added uh, doxazosin before bedtime. Okay. Um, and there was no difference um, initially in stone size. And they did three weeks of follow-up. And um, they got regular KUBs and ultrasounds during that three-week period, as well as at the end. And after the three weeks, if no stones had been um, passed or if the imaging confirms the stones still to be present, they did end up going a uh, ureteroscopy. Um, and they found that um, uh, stone, you know, stone expulsion rate um, differed from 28% you know, um, in group one to roughly 70% in group two. 
um, and the number of daily colic attacks. So need for maybe um, narcotics or, or, or you know, so symptomatic um, you know, pain management was much less in the use of um, doxazosin. And there was also um, uh, a shorter period of time until expulsion from eight days versus six days. Um, similar studies looked also at tamsulosin, um, use of tamsulosin 0.2 milligrams per day in ages less than four, um, and then 0.4 um, in ages greater than four. Um, and their stone free rates were similar, 88% um, uh, with the use of uh, ibuprofen and tamsulosin versus 64% uh, with just uh, ibuprofen at four week follow up. The other, um, you know, uh, management modality that we could use in this setting is also as well. Um, so this study uh, looked at um, patients who are a little bit older, 8.6 8, 8 years of age, uh, mean stone size in the kidney, 12 and a half, so over a centimeter, but still less than two centimeters, um, sub-centimeter stones in the year on average. Um, they, you know, not being in the U.S., their, their guideline, their, the amount of shocks they use was a little bit more variable. They were using up to uh, 3,000 shocks on the kidney. Um, and about 60 to 80 shocks per minute. Um, they found that uh, um, overall as well success rate was near 85% for renal stones and 60% for ureteral stones. Um, those patients who had a larger stone burden or previously had undergone a urologic surgery had much lower success rates. Um, so thus the patients who ended up needing retreatment would being the red bars were usually patients that had ureteral stones that were over 10 millimeter um, or lower pole renal stones. Uh, relative complication rates is very low. Um, the, the most common complication would be renal colic that was seen in 6%. Um, Steinstrass was noted in 1.2% or mm -hmm. six patients who had that in the study. Um, they didn't need a uh, ureteroscopy and 0.8% uh, had a UTI or infection that required antibiotics. So in terms of factors that affect as well, a lot of these are also seen in adults. The one difference um, is the skin to stone distance. Uh, but in terms of stone location, a um, uh, study of Mendel in uh, 2012 uh, showed that in children versus adults for lower pole stones over, uh, sorry, less than two centimeters, Children actually had much higher success rates and passage of stone and fewer complications. Um, uh, in ureteral stones, there was no differences. They were both successful. Uh, stone composition, um, if, if they have a history of stone or have a metabolic abnormality so that you would kind of know that they're you know, cysteine stones or calcium oxalate monohydrate, these tend to be less susceptible. Um, this also falls into line with the stone attenuation. Um, McAdams in 2010 found that in stones that were uh, over 1,000 Hounsfield units, um, uh, they only had a stone free rate of 33% after as well versus 77% if it was less than 1,000 Hounsfield units. Not surprisingly, a lot of these brushite, cysteine, and calcium oxalate monohydrate stones tend to have Hounsfield units over 1,000. And in terms of rate of shockwave delivery, uh, Salem in 2013 looked at 60 children, randomized them to either 80 shocks uh, per minute or 120 shocks per minute. Um, and they found that there was a 90% stone free rate at 80 shocks versus just 74 for 120. So a lower uh, shockwave um, uh, frequency is uh, more successful. Um, and then finally, in terms of uh, just stone size and number of stones, um, the only thing that's predicted is shockwave um, uh, success in terms of stone size is stone diameter, um, best results being less than 11 millimeters of smaller stones. It's um, pretty straightforward. Uh, so now we're going to talk about uh, ureteroscopy. Um, as you know, ureteroscopy is uh, much higher, in, you know, it's, it's, uh, success rates uh, for, um, you know, you know, you're able to see your stones, you're able to directly treat them and then remove them, so much higher um, success. Um, this was the original, like the, the Kim study out of CHOP uh, looked at 167 children. Um, they went on 170 ureteroscopies uh, with follow-up. They had excellent clearance rates. Um, the ureteral stone clearance rate was 100% stone-free um, after just one uh, procedure um, and 97% uh, for renal stones. Um, now, the things that were interesting in this study is that, um, you know, they, if 
they were not able to obtain retrograde access in 95 of the children, that's 57% of the children. Um, they did not um, actively dilate any ureters. They did not, you know, they don't, they didn't believe in performing balloon dilatation due to a risk of developing strictures. Um, they did use um, access sheets of 9.5 and 10 French, um, but only in patients who had previously been pre-stented. Um, so they always believe in placing stents up using the Palmer and Palmer rule of age plus 10, uh, age in years plus 10, which was uh, correct in 94% of the patients in this uh, population. So they would place uh, like a 3.7 or 4.7 French stent and allow for passive dilatation for about one to two weeks, and bring them back for ureteroscopy with excellent results. If they weren't able to get retrograde access. So what I, I, what the guideline I believe is saying is that we shouldn't just pre-stent everyone. We only pre-stent them if we're not able to get um, retrograde access and then bring them back. But if 57% you can't even get access at all, you have to suspect that some other percent are now getting access maybe in a little more precarious position, right? And it sounds like it's yeah. not so simple that we anticipate we not can get access. Not simple at all, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, you know, then there's the discussion is, you know, what, what can you do to get access the first time? You know, can you, can you, should you balloon dilate? Can you use coaxial dilators? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll touch base on that. Um, you know, the first thing is, is, is use of like, um, it's just passively dilate, just place the stent and have them come back, okay? Um, in, in that study, that study where the 57%, they could not um, access primarily, um, you know, majority of these children were young, less than 10 years. Um, they found that if you could pass the five French ureteral catheter, all right, that only correlated with the six to 60 to 70% success rate of um, being able to pass either a seven or seven and a half French uh, ureteroscope. But all the stented ureter, all the pre-stented ureters were accessible. Um, so you know, they, they didn't try to do any sort of more invasive options of trying to, of trying to like dilate the ureter. Um, and um, other studies, Corcoran study, um, they also they ended up having to stent 40% of children. Um, they didn't find any sort of uh, demographic factors that could kind of predict whether they would need a stent or not a stent. Um, so it's kind of a, you go in there if you can't get it. You know, then they stented 40% of the patients needed it, and um, they, they didn't report any sort of complications long term as a result. And they were, you know, 100% accessible second time around. So what about active dilation? Okay, so Smell Don uh, used uh, eight French or 10 French ureteral coaxial dilators um, in 70% of cases in this study. Okay, there's 100 patients, um, did not do any balloon dilatation. And mean follow-up was 10 months. Um, and uh, the overall complication rate was fairly low. The one thing that they saw was uh, uh, ureteral perforations. These were all noted intraoperatively. Um, they required stent placement. Their overall complication rate was 5.2%, which is uh, consistent with uh, other ureteroscopy studies. Um, the one thing that was noted, this was outside of their 10-month follow-up period was one patient uh, had a distal ureteral stricture that they didn't end up needing a reimplantation. Don't know if that was, you know, was most likely due to this, um, but they didn't print, there was no other information into the paper as to whether um, you know, there was any other issues or difficulties or even perforation in that, in that patient. Um, but that was one more, uh, more significant um, complication there. Um, and then, you, you know, your balloon dilators, as you know, are very uncommon. In fact, no one, you know, it seems like it's, it's not something that we really should be doing. Um, there is, there was, I was, found one study uh, where they talked about using it and they a small sample size, only 16 patients, 30% of them needed it. Um, and there was no stricture formation in their um, follow-up period of 10 months. Um, uh, one thing of note, the smell don't study did use access sheets up to 14 French, um, but that was only 10% of their patients. So I don't know if that one patient that had the stricture um, was the 14 French or not. There was no discussion about that. Um, so talk about these ureteral access sheets. There's actually like fairly sparse data on the safety and outcomes of ureteral access sheets in children and pediatric patient population in general. 
um, swing study um, out of Boston. They looked at 96 children, all were under the age of 13, and the average stones were about 10 millimeters. Um, similar follow-up time. Um, they used the urethral excess sheath in about 40% of their cases, um, also going up to you know, uh, uh, 15 French. Um, they noticed uh, complication rates in seven cases, um, which is about the same complication rate as in the smell don't study. Um, there's being uh, perforations, um, passage of submucosal wire, um, and stent migration in one. All of these, um, the first two at least, we managed with the uh, placement of urethral stent. Um, the one thing that they do note is that these complications were more common with the she when a sheath was used. Obviously, pa passing a sheath and using as another wire puts you at more risk for having one of these complications. Um, so that was a significant outcome that excess sheaths cause more risk. Um, but uh, there was no strictures. Um, and there were not uh, associated with, uh, you know, uh, patients. They didn't end up coming back to the emergency room visits with more likelihood of having colic uh, or pain or some sort of obstruction. Um, I'm going to change topics now to PCNLs. Um, so this is the first reported use was in 1985. Um, use has decreased over time. There's uh, incidents uh, or the uses. Uh, numbers gone down from only 5% to 2.5% um, with the concomitant rise in ureteroscopies, most likely due to advanced in technology, more use of the excess sheets. Um, the indications still um, are anatomic abnormalities, uh, stone compositions that are resistant to shockwave, are large stone burdens. Um, with with uh, PCNL also being pediatrics and concerned about blood loss there, the things that, you know, there's there's been a movement towards the miniaturized PCNLs. Um, so in terms of terminology, it's not, it's not standardized. Um, and, and a lot of papers use different scopes and sheets and call them uh, mini PCNs or ultra mini. And they're, they're actually within different buckets here. But in general, uh, mini PCNLs use about 11 to 20 French sheaths um, and a pediatric nine and a half French ureteroscope or nephroscope. Um, and then ultra mini PCNs tend to be smaller sheets, um, not going all the way up to 16 or 20 French. And then micro PCN is something that we don't have uh, here in the US. It's not approved here, but that's the use of a 4.8 French um, all seeing needle, which has direct visual um, um, optics on the tip of the needle uh, that you can use when getting access. Um, so you're not placing um, uh, the needle blind. Uh, downsides of these miniaturized PCNs are, um, you know, using uh, that small uh, access sheath, you'll have limited continuous irrigation, uh, poor endoscopic visualization, and uh, stone fragment extraction. Um, there's also the theoretical risk of um, uh, higher elevated renal pelvic pressures um, intraoperatively. Um, as you know, this backflow can occur with 30 millibars of renal perfusion pressure, and using a 16 uh, French sheath has been shown to have pressures in the high 20s. Um, so in terms of uh, mini PCN versus ureteroscopy, um, uh, much higher success rates with uh, the mini PCN in uh, larger stones over two centimeters, um, higher rates of blood loss, uh, but less fluoro time uh, and less fluoro time with OR time and hospitalization with ureteroscopy. Um, this was, a, this was a very interesting study. This is out of China. They used the, uh, it's called the Chinese mini PCNL because they use um, an endoscopic pulsed perfusion pump, which exists in 42 of their facilities over there. Um, and it creates a really high pressure for about three seconds and then it stops for two seconds. And by timing the synchronized removal of the endoscope through the sheath during the low flow period, you're able to create a vacuum in the sheath and remove all the fragments. So you have very high success rates with removing a stone. I have a 95% stone free rate. Um, but these were, these were children who are, you know, uh, seven to 36 months with large stones, anywhere from two to three centimeters. So this is pretty, um, pretty impressive. Um, and then there was uh, no loss in GFR. Um, the kidneys had normal growth afterwards after a single access. Um, um, uh, no loss of GFR. And in terms of uh, recurrence rate at five years, um, overall recurrence rates up to 55%. In, in stones that in children require surgery. So the, the, the conclusion here is in children who have stones that require surgery, they should be followed 
moving forwards because they have a very high recurrence rate. Um, and then uh, it'd be very useful to also not only get imaging to document that you cleared them, but also to get 24 hour urines um, to document sort of abnormalities, um, uh, metabolically speaking.